So this is the second part of our um, chapter four, data sets and Excel tables topic. And we have this, uh, the same workbook that we were working before, but instead of working in the raw data, we're working in the data in a table. Now, before I jump into the data in the table, I do want to show you something in the raw data. Um, we do have at the bottom of Excel something called a status bar. And that's down here where we see the ready. And notice how if I highlight some numerical data in my status bar, <clears throat> I have some statistics. I get the average, the count, and the sum of the values that are selected. Conversely, if I highlight, say, some text data, I'll get a again the statistics for it, but this time it's just going to be a count. Now I'm going to highlight some numbers again and come down here. I'm going to right click my um, status bar and okay so Excel for Mac is a little different uh, oh yeah here it is here so we can uh, you can see the the check marks here that I could add the minimum and the maximum so now I have the minimum seen there or I could go back and get rid of it and then it's gone so you can right click the status bar and add whatever different types of statistics that you like to it so I just want to show you that so for the data in the table, the first thing we have to do is create a table. And there's a couple of different ways that we can do that. We can be in our data and we can go insert. And on the insert ribbon, we see this table icon. And if we click on the table icon, we get this create table window that highlights um, the, uh, the range of data that we have. And it, indicates that we have table of headers. I'm going to cancel out of that. There's a quick key that we could also use, control T, or even on the Mac, command T would work, and it brings up the same window. And I'm going to go OK. And you'll see that now my information, my rows and columns of information, are now in what we call an Excel table. And I know that because now I have this context specific ribbon coming up for a table. I have here a table name and I have some different looks like formatting for my table. So let's take a look first at the formatting. We have a header row, we have banded rows. I could deselect the banded rows. I sort of like them, so I'm going to bring them back in a minute. I could band the columns, you know, and these band this banding is to allow things to be maybe read a little bit more easily. I'm not a fan of the columns, so I'm going to go back to the banded rows. We have the automatic filter button put on it. We could take it off if we don't like it. Again, I'm going to leave it on for our lesson. We have different um, styles that we could pick for our table. So we have the different styles and we've seen these types of things before. And here, here's a white table style medium. There's the orange, there's the blue. I'm just going to leave it on the default. But again, we could, you know, sort of hover over the different ones, wait for the name to come up. Okay. And we could actually create a new style if we wanted to, or we could just clear the formatting. So as I said, I'm just going to leave it the default. Okay. We have other things up here, as I said, we can name our table and it's actually good practice in any spread in any workbook and any spreadsheet to actually name your tables. So I'm going to call this delivery data. And you'll notice that I have a space between delivery and data. And when I hit the return button, I get an error window. So the syntax of the name for the table is not correct. It has to start with a letter or an underscore. It cannot include a space or a character that's not allowed, and it can't conflict with an existing name in the workbook. So I'll just go OK. I'll come back up here. I'll go delete. So now there's no space. And now I don't get the error. Another good practice for naming tables is to precursor all your tables with maybe TBL as short form for table. Now, the reason why that's handy is that if you remember back to one of our previous lessons, so let's go into our formulas, we had names that we were looking at. So we had define name, we could define a name for a cell or a range of cells. We also had, let's click off that for a minute, we could create one from a selection. And again, this is Excel for Mac. So let's try and find our where is it? 
Okay, so in a Mac, in the formulas tab, we don't have the named range um, or the name manager icon, but if we click on define a name, we can see here that we already have these names are existing in this particular workbook. And say, for example, I had uh, a number of tables. If I precursor them all with TBL, then I could easily um, find and reference all these different tables and then the information within. Them. So I'm just gonna close out of that for now. Now, in addition to creating the table, so let's go back to that table icon or table ribbon, I should say. And remember, we have to be in the um, information or in the Excel table to see that. If I click outside of it, that context ribbon goes away. If I click in my table, it comes back. Now we have the option here to convert our data back to a range. So if we select that, it gives us a, yeah, you sure you wanna do this? And we can go yes. And now I don't have a table anymore, so I don't have that context specific uh, ribbon. I could come here and go insert. Well, there's my icon is not grayed out, so I know that this is not a table. So that's different ways I know this is not a table. But one of the difficulties that happens is that when you've created a table and then converted it back to a range like we just did, it maintains this formatting from the table. So it can be a little bit visually confusing. Okay, so just keep in mind, you know, I'm going to go control T, make this back a table. If we're not sure it's a table or not, click in it somewhere, you should see that context specific ribbon, and you should also see the table name. Now I'm going to go back here and rename it delivery data. Okay. And be careful, you know, you saw me just do it right now. It's so easy to put a space between words, but you will get that uh, error window or error message come up saying that that's not a correct syntax. So we've created a table, we've converted it back to a range, we've taken a look at the styles for the table, we took a look at the banding of the rows and the columns, again just visual cues to make things easier to read, and then we named it, converted it back to range, and then brought it back. Okay. All right, let's take a look at what we're going to do next. So just like in a regular spreadsheet, we can add table rows and table columns. So for example, before I do that, what if I wanted to highlight just the information in column C and or actually in table column C, okay, because there's a difference. Here, if I highlight C, I have the whole column. But if I just want this information here, I can click on the driver's name and then click on the line between the driver's name and the names and see how now it's just the table column that's been selected, not the entire column. So again, whole column, so you can see it's highlighted all down, table column, click the title, click the line below it, and now we have just the information in the table. We can insert a column. So again, I could be anywhere in the table. I can right click and I could go insert and see how we have this different menu now, table columns to the left or table rows above. So if I click this one, now I have a new column. I'm just going to undo that. And if I go insert again, table rows above, okay, and I could be in that row and say, okay, right click it and I'm going to delete. And again, we get the table specific menu for columns and rows. So delete that table row and it's gone. Okay. Another neat feature of this is that I could come down to the bottom of my table, wherever it might be, because remember, you know, I've only got 20, 25 uh, rows in this particular table, but you know, we're thinking of something with 250,000 type of thing. So maybe I go in 100 and then 033. And as soon as I hit the return or the tab, notice how it created a new table row for me. The same type of thing happens for the columns. So I'm just going to insert a regular column first. Okay, and I'm going to insert, well actually I'm going to undo that because it's confusing with the, uh, the highlights there. So I'm going to come over here and insert. So now it's just a regular column here. And I'm just going to say, test. 
So notice I'm just typing information in M1, and as soon as I hit enter, it's recognizing, Excel is recognizing that, well, I'm beside a table, so it's anticipating, oh, she wants to create a new column in that table. So we can insert them in between the, both the column and the row, and we can also insert them at the end, and it's automatically considered. I'm just going to do that because I don't want that one, so get rid of it. Something else we could do. In sheet three, I just created a couple of new entries, and maybe I want to add this to my table. So I'm going to go Command C to copy it. Data in the table. I'm going to come down here. I'm going to go Command V to paste it. And again, notice it's created new table rows. Okay. So just inserting, deleting, that's what we can do. So I'm going to highlight these because I don't really want them. And I'm going to delete the table rows. Now, something else that we can do with tables, and I'm just going to do it here. I'm going to highlight um, rows. No, I'm just going to take the table rows. So I'm going to just take these rows here. So table rows 11. Oops, no, you know what? Let's do this a different way. I'm going to take, highlight this cell. A9, I'm going to highlight it, click it. Okay, that's not a functionality that happens in, in Mac, so we won't use that. Okay, I'll go back to my original. I'll take orders 10, 11, 12, and 13. I'm going to highlight over to there. I'm going to copy them, so Command C. And I'm going to go Command V. And so now we have duplicate information. OK, so we saw just in regular raw data that we could delete duplicate rows. Well, if in my if I'm in my table, my Excel table, and I go to my context specific ribbon, I also have remove duplicates. So I'm going to go remove duplicates. We're just going to just like we did before, just keep all the defaults, go OK. And again, it comes back with, well, I had copied four rows and pasted them to the bottom. They were duplicates. So it says the four duplicate values were found and removed and 24 are remaining. And just like before, it gets rid of the second occurrence. So here's still my orders 10, 11, 12, and 13, where they were supposed to be. I had added them to the bottom and now they're gone. So again, we can remove duplicates. Okay. All right. So just a little bit of functionality for our tables, recognizing how to create them, how to uncreate them, how to name them, how to insert things, copy stuff into it, etc. Again, let's do some things like we did before. We have the driver's name is one column or one cell, and we want to split them. So like before, I can start typing John and go to the next cell and go control e and that's going to be my flash fill and again it does it just for the table this works a little differently from um excel for mac than excel for for when for pcs um if excel for pcs if you take a look at that video as soon as i start typing the uh, john it starts auto populating but again we can do it one way or the other so there's my May, and I can go Control E, and I get the last names again. So flash fill working in tables, just like it did in the raw data. Let's take a look at our emails. Now, last time around, we had tried to create emails, and we were using a function called text join. And we saw how with well raw data, that didn't seem to work really, really well. OK, we had a lot of problems. Well, watch what happens when I start typing. John and notice it's lowercase dot may again lowercase at happy dot ca and I want the dot not the comma so happy dot ca and I go enter notice it picks it up that that's an actual email link okay so now that's going to be an active link if it was a real email and I can go again control e and the pattern is created 
So that's a nice feature that we can automatically create um, an email really, really easily in an Excel table, much more easily than in just regular raw data. Okay, let's take a look uh, at adding a total row. So for a total row, notice how at the bottom of my, my table, it automatically puts this row with totals in it. And I can go to any column and I can come to a drop down and it will give me different statistics that we could insert. Now, this is the last name. It doesn't really make sense to do anything other than just count the number of occurrences. In price here, let's use some different statistics. Let's take a look at the average price. And then the number of items, let's maybe sum them. And then the default, I don't know if you noticed it, but when I added the um, table, the total row, it automatically puts in the very last column the count. Okay, so you could get rid of that, say no, I don't want it, or you could just leave it there. Okay. Now, this is an important feature of tables. It makes it really, really handy because watch these numbers. So let's maybe focus on the, the last name if we start using filtering. So first off, before I do that, I'm gonna highlight the names. Remember we said that in the um, raw data sheet, we saw that if I highlighted different cells, I would get some summary statistics down in the status bar. And notice how we get count 24. Let's do the same thing for the price. So again, notice we have here, this was the average 796.70. There's the average in the status bar. So just bringing that to your attention. So uh, let's do something here. Let's actually now filter and let's filter it just so that we see May. Okay, so notice there's 24 currently in the count and 796 in the price average. Let's just select May and notice how now this total row automatically updates. So now there's seven occurrences of May and the average price for John May of all the different items is $725.99. So that's sort of a nifty feature of Excel tables is that you can filter things and your total row automatically updates. Now again, I could maybe filter on more than one column. So I'm going to keep the last name May. I'm going to come to items and I'm going to filter on, let's pick washing machines. Well, before I do that, let's actually add a total here. So let's add the, um, I guess we're just going to have to put count here. So let's now filter on washing machines. And again, we notice now that there's two occurrences, the total row has updated for the filter on last name, item, and price. Okay, so it's a really handy feature, especially for presentation purposes. If you wanted to filter things, or even if you just wanted to find out some quick and dirty information, you could use the total row and the filters, and that would help you quite a bit. Let's go back. Let's take a look at all the items again. Okay, and let's maybe change this Let's, instead of the average, let's, let's just leave it as, let's just leave that like that for now. And let's come into price and let's do a number filter. So let's pick one here. We don't want it by color. We want it by number. And let's say we want it greater than or equal to, let's make it 850. Okay, so let's put 850 in here. And notice how again, let's just drag this a little bit to the side. <coughs> now it's only listing the things that were greater than 850. If I get rid of that and bring that back to none, all of them are listed. So if I want a number filter, I can go greater than or equal to, and I can put my value in. And now it's filtering based on a number filter. Okay, let's just take that off for now. Let's take the, choose one, 
and get rid of it. Okay. We can also filter by dates. So let's take a look at the date filter here and let's maybe filter uh, greater than or let's say between February 4th and 6th. Let's try that one. So here we have noticed that because I've chosen this field now, it recognizes it, recognizes it as a date. So I'm going to go between and let's put between and we can go uh, one slash four slash 2017 oops 17 oh i wanted it between i picked the wrong one between there we go <laughs> okay sorry I, I i accidentally switched it to to after so after this and before let's go one slash two slash okay hang on i'm entering the data incorrectly um, okay, um, one slash six slash 2017. And obviously I have this in wrong order. So let's go four slash one slash 2017. And let's go four slash six slash 2017. Okay, it's not liking how I'm entering my data. So I'm just gonna, oh, there, there's a nice feature in, in Max. So let's pick this date and let's pick that date. Let's drag it to the side and we have it. Now I did say after <clears throat> and before. So I did want it as between. So why does it keep doing that? Between and the Max doesn't seem to be working very well. This is very strange. Okay, let's clear the filter. Let's come back to date. Let's try it again. Let's do the between, or actually, you know what? Let's do, no, that's all dates in the period. That's not gonna work. Okay, third, fourth, sixth. There we go. That's a different way to do it, okay? so. The between, you know, is a little quirky, I guess, in the, the Mac for Excel. So this is an option if I wanted to see, um, including February 4th, 5th, and 6th, I could use this option, which was the uh, all dates in a period. If I click on the between, though, it's going to bring up this before and after. So let's see what it does here. Let's clear the filter for a minute. Let's go back to the between don't want after, I want between, I keep clicking in the wrong spot. Okay, this just does not seem to want to work for me. I empathize with you Excel Mac users. So I'm going to try it one last time. Oops, I found the wrong field, that would be why. Let's try the between. And Nope. Between the fourth. Wow, Excel for Mac. Yeah, this is really, now it's because I've selected a date. So between the fourth and let's come down here. Holy Hannah. So there's the fourth. All right, I don't know why this is being so difficult. Let's pick February 1st. Holy, I don't envy you Mac users. Okay, it's letting me come up here. No, I don't want, I guess maybe I could try that. Let's go back to 2017. I'm determined to try and get this to work. This is where your resiliency really comes into play with Excel, especially when you have the max. And let's pick between the third and the sixth. Okay, and then that worked. Okay, so looks like it's a little quirky with actually filling in information here. So maybe the best thing is to use the, the calendar. 
Okay, and I'm just going to clean that filter, clear that filter. So I just wanted to show you that you could filter like we've done before to get the total row information uh, updating, but then you could also have number filters, you could also have date filters. Okay, you could even filter on color if you have some color for your, your data. I'm going to get rid of all my filters now. So it doesn't look like they have anything else. And now I'm back to normal. Okay, so that was the filtering. Let's take a look at the sorting. Now with the sorting, remember, so I'm in my table, data, and we have these options here. Just like in regular data, it is not recommended to sort within the filtering window unless you're only going to be sorting by one column. Additionally, it's not good practice to use these guys, these icons here to sort in a table either, unless you're only sorting by one column. And let's just take a look at that again. So here's our, let's, we're in column E. So if I go sort, now the last names are all sorted. But if I come over to item and go sort, well, now my names aren't sorted anymore. So just to illustrate, you know, why that's not a good practice. So I'm back to my original sort by the order number. So let's go into our sort icon. And again, we get our sort window. And just like before, we can sort by different values. So let's sort by last name. Let's leave it A to Z. Let's add a level. Let's sort by uh, item. And again, we'll leave it A to Z. And let's come by. Um, do another one and let's sort by the price and we'll get the smallest to largest. Just like before, we could have a custom list and I don't have a custom list created. So we're gonna have to cancel out of that. We'll have to go okay. If you remember how to do the custom list, we have to come up to our Excel, go to preferences, go to custom lists, and I'm just going to drag this over to the side and I'm going to create an entry and we're going to put TVs first, then we're going to go microwave, then washing machine and refrigerator next. So those are the four items we have. We'll add it. We can close our window. We can come back to our sort, and this is where for our item, I'm going to pick my custom list and cursor down to it. it was the last one I created and go OK and OK. So now we have sorted by last name, then the item according to the custom list I created, and then the price. Okay. So the filtering and sorting work very similarly. Now something interesting that occurs with um, calculations in tables is if I want to calculate the amount, remember formula equals, and then I can point to my data. But notice how this time around, we have something different showing up. It's not showing, showing cell G2. It's showing square bracket at price square bracket. And price is the name of that table column. And the at symbol means that, well, that's just in the same row as the where I'm trying to enter the formula. I can keep going and go multiply by number of items, and it brings the same thing in with same row, field name, number of items. And we can go enter, and notice how it does it for the entire table. So I don't have to copy down the formula like I would normally have to do with just raw data. It automatically calculates it for us. Now we're going to go into what these are called in just a minute, but I'm going to undo that for a second. Another way we can do it is again with the equals. Now press the open square brackets and you'll see how now we have a list of the field names. So there's the at symbol for this row and we're going to take the price. We're going to close the square brackets and notice how it's highlighted the entire Excel table, except of course for the total row, multiply by, open square brackets again, brings up the list of field names, and we're going to say number of items, 
close the square brackets. Now we have the two um, columns selected. And notice this time around, we don't have that at symbol. Okay, so it's going to work either way. And if I go enter, it still populates it. But this time around, I'm seeing if I go up into my formula bar here, I'm not seeing that at symbol. So it's the at symbol is sort of redundant. When we first do it, it just means that I've pointed to the cell versus gone from the list. All right. Well, if you in your sheet, if you go over to the right, I do have a couple of instructions here that you can try some diff different things on your own. Conditional formatting we're going to do next week, though. But try to go to this link, and I'm going to do that right now. I already have it open, so I'm just going to minimize this, go into my Chrome, maximize it, and go to the link. I don't want to deal with that. And with Excel tables, we have something called structured references. So it's qualified, unqualified is one term, and structured and unstructured is another term. So here, structured reference, it's a special feature of Excel that references tables. So we can see here that this is a table that we've created. We're calculating the percent rejects and we've pointed to the cells and we've gotten rejects, so at rejects field divided by at output. So in order to be able to use this structured reference, we need to create a table. And we had seen how to do that. You can put your cell, you can highlight your entire range of information if you want, but you could just go control T or command T on a Mac, whichever you prefer, they both work on a Mac, and the range will come up you'll have your headers, you'll go okay. So now there's your table. Again, we have that context specific tab that comes up. Now in uh, this is a regular PC um, screenshot from the net. So it's the design tab for tables. But in uh, it's very similar to the, the Mac one, we'll go back into Excel in a minute, you'll see it again. And again, the table name. So just good practice to name your table. Now here's an example of creating an additional column. So percent rejects, as soon as we enter that, we get a table column that we now have to fill in. And then we can come and start pointing to our cells. So we go equals, we point to D3, and it comes up at rejects. And that's a structured reference why is it structured? Because it's using the structure of the table, the header names. Unstructured would mean when we have just regular raw data, we're pointing to the actual cell reference. So we'd be seeing D3 in our actual formula. Notice we're not seeing D3 in the formula, we're seeing the structure of the table. And again, the at symbol just means the current row. We're then just going to divide, and this particular site is showing us the two ways where it pointed to the at rejects the first time round. This time round, it's saying, okay, let's use that open square brackets where we see the list of fields, and then we choose the one we want, which was the output, and again, it shows the at output, and we get our total calculation, all right? Now that's for structured reference. Now when we have qualified and unqualified, so a formula that includes a structured reference can be what we call qualified or unqualified. If it's a calculation happening inside the actual Excel table, it's typically unqualified. And all we mean by that is that unqualified means there's no need to indicate the table name. If we wanted to have a qualified cell reference, and here's an example for this one where we're calculating the output, and they're just taking the sum of the output, but notice how this, the output, is outside, it's not inside the actual Excel table. So, entered the formula sum. Now here, remember they named this table production, so that's the table name. That's why it's a qualified cell reference. Qualified meaning you're including the table name. Unqualified, no table name. 
okay? And then the actual field name, okay? So there's your sum production output. That's a qualified reference is making use of both the table name and the column output. And that would be your result, okay? So structured references are great for tables because now we're using actual header names and it, you know, it's a little bit more representative versus just D3 or G5 or X22 type of thing. And they're very, very dynamic. Anytime there's a change in the table, these formulas will continue to work. So let's go back to our Excel. So we can see here, let me just escape out of there. These here are unqualified cell references. Let's take a look at a qualified one and let's do the sum of amount. And I'm just gonna add it here in the table row, just for fun, okay? So there's the sum here, but now I can go equals sum, okay? Pick my function. Okay, and oops, I clicked a little too much there. And I'm going to go uh, TBL. And notice how, because I went TBL, it's gonna look for my table names. So there's my table delivery data. So there's my table name. And then I'm gonna open my square brackets and I'm going to pick, where's the amount? Oh, there it is down there, amount. Close my square brackets. Notice how it's highlighted the amount data. And I'll just close my rounded brackets and equals. And see, we get this is now a formula outside the table. And it's qualified because in order for the function to work correctly, I have to reference the table name. Okay. So just an example of unqualified in the table, qualified outside the table. And again, just for fun, you know, if we had highlighted all the information and let's do it a different way. Ooh, let's come back. I'm clicking a little too fast these days. So I can highlight this, do this to highlight. Well, now it's got all the table information. If I check my status bar, now the sum is more, right? Because I have that table row. If I come back to my table and in my table, table ribbon, take off that total row, do the same thing, highlight just my table information. There's the sum 432 and in my status row, there's 432. So with tables, it's just a little easier to do some things than other things, okay? So that should give you enough uh, to start with to be able to continue on your simulation training and your simulation exam actually do the first two parts of it so that you're staying on track and can get them done and then you can even maybe start your mid-level and your capstone and 